As was mentioned at the start, my name is Chris Odie, and I am honored to serve as the pastor of what is known as the Living Stones Prison Congregation. I'm going to take a quick moment just to show you a piece of Living Stones, but I promise you it's going to relate back to the worship, or excuse me, to the sermon today, to the gospel that we just heard. And uh, as I think I told you the last time I was here, worst case scenario, you won't have to deal with me next week. So just bear with this bit, and we'll all make it through. Again. At Living Stones Prison Congregation, we gather in the name of Christ. We hear the word of God. We share the family meal. And we are sent with the Spirit. We are just like you, church. In a place where hope can be hard, God still speaks. God's community still gathers, and God's spirit still prevails. Come and see. I didn't just want to share that with you to uh, be self-promoting or something like that. I want to share that with you because I think it relates directly to today's gospel reading. We heard Jesus today say, the good news has been proclaimed to the poor, that the prisoners have been released, that the blind have their sight, the oppressed have gone free. Well, I still minister in a prison. I cannot help but read and hear these words today and have a moment where I think to myself, what? It's been fulfilled? My guys are still locked up. They're still inside. I won't dive into the poor right now or the blind or the oppressed, but I know that I can speak firsthand about the experiences of the inmates right now, at least here in Washington State. I was just there a few days ago. On Wednesday, I went into the Washington Correction Center in Shelton to gather together with the men for worship and discovered that we wouldn't be doing that that day. That once again, because of outbreaks and the resulting lockdowns, worship was canceled and the men were sequestered to their units. So instead of gathering together in small groups of 20 to celebrate the love of God and enjoy each other's company, I found myself wandering around the facility, checking in with various staff members to see how they were doing walking into the gym and seeing 120 mats being laid out, on the laid out on the floor for men to sleep on for literally God only knows how long. Tables off to the side where men would normally be sitting playing dominoes or talking, instead filled with bed rolls and spare jumpsuits. We still have prisoners. The word's been fulfilled in our hearing, but we still have them. They're still there. We know the poor are still out there. I just drove down from my home near Seattle to Tacoma Friday night to go visit some friends and play some board games. I saw the tents. I saw the tent cities. Stop and think about the insanity of that for just a moment. The fact that that's a phrase I can use and we all know what I'm talking about, a tent city. I'm a Northwest kid. I grew up in Auburn. If I drop a y'all at some point during the worship service, now you'll know why. I'm pretty sure I don't think it's just the halcyon memory. I don't think it's just the, the lens of nostalgia looking back to the past i'm pretty sure when i was a kid i remember seeing people on the street i remember interacting with them sometimes giving them cash i remember my youth group going to the compass 
center down in downtown Tacoma and, or Seattle in Pike's Place to hand out meals. I I remember sometimes seeing a tent or two. I don't remember tent cities. Am I wrong? Am I crazy? Am I just forgetting? Release to the prisoners and good news to the poor and sight to the blind and setting the oppressed free. What does it mean that these have been fulfilled in our hearing? I know that in my human brokenness, my human ignorance, my first response when I hear that is to think to myself, well, it must mean that it's over. It's done. It's taken care of. That's all off the table. And yet, as I said, I look around and it's still there. So what gives? What's going on? I'll, I'll be honest with you as a pastor. I'm not sure I have all the answers to that. In fact, I'm not sure I have any. Some days it feels like the best thing I can do is offer up good questions. And I'm not even sure if I have that right now, because these questions seem obvious when I stop and think about it. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today. Maybe that's part of the key, huh? The idea that it isn't someday, that someday these things will be addressed, that someday these things will be tackled, that someday these things will be important, but today, today they will be fulfilled in our hearing. If we look at the Greek and we break it down, it literally says that today these things will be fulfilled in our ears. And maybe that's part of the key too. Today these things will be fulfilled in our taking these words into us and wrestling with them. In recognizing the gap between what is and what could be. And not even what could be, but what should be. The children's message earlier, I made the comment about this sermon that I've you know, been told I should preach someday, God loves you, go home, or the version I want to do, God loves you, what are you going to do about it? How will you respond? How will you take this gift that God has given you, has given us? How will you apply it? How will it change your life? How will it change the world? And I think there's a connection there. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, these words of God are fulfilled in you taking them end in and not letting them go. Not giving up. Not letting the chaos and pain and frustration of the last two years or two decades or two centuries or two millennia be overwhelming, but instead be inspiring, be something that leads us to continue to do God's work. It's that motto of the ELCA or slogan or whatever you want to call it, God's work, our hands. You've heard that before, right? God loves us. How do we respond to that love? What do we do with it? What do we do with that precious gift of life and forgiveness that we have been given? How do we take that and apply it to others? Not as some sort of guilt thing, but as an opportunity, as an obligation, not in the sense of a burden, but an obligation in the sense of a gift. The beginning of worship, there was the, the land declaration acknowledgement that was made. We acknowledge this gift that we have been given by God of God's love. Please don't misunderstand where I was going with that. I was not saying God gave us this land as a gift. That's, wow, not where I was going. Just to be explicit and clear. We have this love. We have this forgiveness. How do we respond? What do we do with it? You as a congregation are an active and awesome faith community. I have been blessed over the last, oh boy, has it been almost 10 years? 10 years living in the Northwest Washington Synod 
to have observed from afar some of the things that you have been involved with. Ways in which you have striven to live out your call. To be explicitly welcoming of the LGBTQ plus community. To be deliberately involved with seminaries and opportunities internationally and domestically. God loves us. This is how we respond. This is what we do. Not because we have to as an obligation, but because we must as just the natural response to have experienced this love and forgiveness and grace. Years ago, a colleague and friend and I dare say mentor of mine made the comment to me, it was, oh, what's the uh, famous theologian who said it? Pascal, Pascal's wager. He said that he would rather believe and be right than not believe and be wrong. And I thought to myself, you know, that's, a, I can't, I can't relate to that way of thinking. I'd rather believe and be wrong than not believe and be right. And what I mean by that is that whatever the truth is of God's nature ultimately would be the same. But my faith in Christ and my faith in God's love expressed to us in that manner, it directs how I relate to my neighbor. It influences how I parent. God loves us. How do we respond? This notion of the scripture being fulfilled in our hearing, the way that it rattles in our ears and what we do with it and what comes out as a result of our struggle with it. I showed you that video at the start of the worship community of Living Stones. And I guess the reason I wanted to share that with you is because because I wanted to give you a glimpse of how that worship body functions, because that's what it is. It's a worship community. It's not a ministry being brought into the prison. It is a ministry within the prison that we bring visitors inside to experience. The folks who gather with us for worship are guests, loved and beloved guests. They aren't there to save the men. They're there to experience a piece of God's love in a place that they would not expect to find it. And that's really the story of Christ, isn't it? That's what all of this is about. That God's love has been made known to us in a way, in places, in a time in which we would not expect, in which our human logic would never come up with. in service, in humility, in recognizing the good of the community and working for its betterment. As I said before, you are an active and awesome and loving faith community. You have weathered changes and challenges and you have remained faithful to the gospel and faithful to the command to care for those who are vulnerable, to advocate for, but also to empower with. May each and every day of your ministry as a congregation and as individuals be an example of the scripture being fulfilled in your hearing. Amen.